Sweden, it's a long time coming, huh? Yeah. Finally. We I can't yeah, we kind of blew our minds that we've been doing this for about 6 years now. So, it's good to be here. Ah, great. Thank you. Um yeah, so if you don't know who I am, my name is Blake Dyer. I've lived with Teal for 15 years. She escaped from uh, her abusive situation to, to my kitty cat explosion. And, um, and so it was funny. I was uh, introducing her on stage the other night in London and talking about how I, I you know, I was like, sure, you're always so serious, you know? <laughs> like, um, and I was thinking I was going to uh, bring a bit of uh, a happiness into her life by by showing her how I live, and and I was and it turns out that I was just suppressing everything, and that wasn't true happiness. <laughs> so, so now I'm I'm sad and happy at the same time. No, it's much more rich, you know. Yeah, <laughs> it's all of it. You know, so so I thank her for that, and uh, it's so good to uh, be able to uh, bring her to you guys and 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 be here. And Teals won't come out. you guys. Is this working? Yes. We're good? All right. It's good to be here in Sweden. This is the first time actually for me. In body. <laughs> yeah, I may or may not have been checking up on some of you. <laughs> um, yeah, so I decided that I'd ham it up and be like super American and wear like a pageant dress today. Do you like that? Yeah. I couldn't help myself. But Okay, so I have to talk to you a little bit about this culture. By raise of hands, I want to know how many of you are actually from this area. A fair bit, okay. Uh, let's go Nordic countries. Oh, yes. Okay, before we start, I want to throw you into an exercise actually this morning, but before we start doing that, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about... Um, Nordic countries and how that relates to how patterns are passed through families. Families, it's not just genetics that we hand down, and as some of you may know, genetics are actually 12 dimensions. So if you, if you dissect genetics beyond just what we see on a physical level, what we see is 12 different dimensions to genetics. So you actually come into your life experience having downloaded every memory from every ancestor that has ever come before you. That should overwhelm you. <laughs> but the most important thing to understand about families is that it's the tools that we cope with that we pass from one generation to the next, and that's where we get the most in trouble. Because some of those tools, they work for us, and some of them don't. And most of these tools are developed based off of survival, whatever helped us to survive. In the Nordic countries, what life looked like way back when in the winter time was that a whole bunch of people had to cram into a very small area to survive through the winter. Now, just for fun, I want you to imagine what would happen if I did that with, say, a group of Brazilians or Mexicans. <laughs> so just tell me what would happen. What would happen in a hot blood culture is I would open that door in the spring and I would be lucky if I found body parts. <laughs> so the tool that was developed in the Nordic countries was stoicism, which is the capacity to create emotional distance even when you're physically in the same place. And this is not something which the Nordic cultures have transcended. It's a tool that has been passed down and passed down, regardless of the fact that we now have all the technology in the world to not be living, you know, 16 people or even 100 sometimes per small 
little housing unit. And it, this, in, in terms of what I'm concerned with in the world, is what is um, the least beneficial to the Nordic cultures. I got some, some good news. I'm doing a whole blog on this, by the way. I'm doing an energetic diagnosis on Stockholm. <laughs> yeah. I had fun last night. I was such a peeping Tom. I was like... <laughs> looking inside people's houses. Nobody uses drapes here. It'll be fun though, I promise. When you read this, you're gonna like it. But what I wanna start off with today in the experiential exercise we're gonna do is based off of my findings here. It's not much different from places like Norway, same thing, sort of Nordic culture, same tool, same coping mechanism, which is to create so much emotional distance. But as I will keep touching on over and over and over today, this emotional distance is why so many people in this area of the globe don't actually know what it is that they're missing. It's like there's so much emotional distance between each other and so actually a lot of emotional needs that are being unmet, but nobody even knows what that would look like for them to be met, so it's almost like I'm confused about why I don't feel quite right, but I don't know what it is. I'll get into that later. The first exercise that we're going to do, because I want to pop this bubble um, that exists between all of you guys, is we're gonna do a similarity exercise. I really like this, I'm hoping it brings the tone emotionally up in this room before we start the meat of this workshop. So we're gonna, where's Corinna? Can I have Corinna come here? Hi, Corinna. I'm having my resident German organize things for me because I can't do it. <laughs> I'm gonna explain the exercise and then she's gonna explain how to organize yourselves into the exercise. Sound good? Okay, the exercise goes like this. I'm gonna get you in a group, and then I'm giving each one of you four minutes. So let's say that the three of us were in a group, right? I would get four minutes, and during those four minutes, I'm the center of focus. Usually I like to do this in a circle, but this time we're not gonna do it in a circle because this is obvious we're gonna break our necks if we try that. You guys are gonna focus on me if it's my turn, and for four minutes, it's their job to tell me how they are the same as me, or how I'm the same as them, same thing. So what might you say? Um, like something easy to start would be, we're both women. <laughs> okay, we're both women. Yeah. By the way, I'm gonna stretch you here because you can say things like that if you really want to, but I want you to keep going deeper and deeper and deeper. You can use your intuition if you want to. We can tell a lot more about people than we consciously think. So, dig deeper. How am I the same as you? We both enjoy good food. That's true. <laughs> do you want to do this? Do me, do me. <laughs> no, 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 it's my turn, so you go. Oh, my turn. No, it's my turn. Okay. <laughs> this is how it's going to go. Okay. <laughs> so I'm doing you. Yes. Okay. okay. He actually has never done this we before. We are good at intuitively, subconsciously matching clothes. Sorry, that's, that wasn't very deep, was it? Nor accurate. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm horrible up here. You shouldn't put me up here. Okay. Um, we both enjoy, I don't know, depth of people. We do. Yes. That's true about you? Yeah. For those of you that don't know, Blake is the most avoidant of all the people in my group of doing anything deep, especially shadow work. <laughs> no. You want more? I want one, one thing, come on. One thing. You guys better do better than this. <laughs> this is what happens when we don't pre-prepare. See, like, I just tell my team, I'm showing up, and you guys get ready to be thrown into whatever, and you're not going to know what it is, and this is what I get in return. Okay. Um. Sorry. 
um, we're both good at processing our emotions, also the negative ones. That's true. Okay, so this is how it goes. Better than that. <laughs> One person. It's going to be my turn. I get four minutes. I'm literally saying nothing, and this is your challenge. You want to treat all of these things like they're meditative exercises. When I put you into the experiential exercises, if you want to get the most that you can out of these workshops, my suggestion is not to chit-chat. And this is what we do as people when we get really super uncomfortable, right? We immediately just start talking about something that has nothing to do with the exercise that is making us feel vulnerable. But I don't want you to approach it this way. So if I am the one who is the center of focus in this scenario, for those four minutes, I don't get to say one thing. I just get to notice what people see in me. You know, because some of these people you're not going to have ever met before, hopefully. And they're still going to have to kind of feel into you, see into you, and listen to you, and really pay attention so as to try to ascertain what's the same about you. And feel, when you're in this position, how much closer it makes you feel. We're going to be talking today about the difference between closer and further apart as two basic movements within the universe that you need to concern yourself with. So feel, feel how when somebody is telling you how you're the same instead of how you're different, it kind of breaks down that barrier and pops the bubble. So that will be four minutes per person, then we're gonna switch. But I don't want any of you to be quiet, okay? I'm really challenging you. So it would be if we were, of course, we're a group of three. She goes, then he goes, then the next person goes. And for as long as that four minutes takes, if we have to continue, we'll keep going. So we'll do a second time until that timer goes off. And we're gonna be breaking you off into groups of eight. So would you like to explain how this arrangement goes? You guys ready? Okay, since I have a lot of newbies here, I'm going to explain how the synchronization workshop actually works. Those of you who have heard the spiel already, this is going to be remedial, but for those of you who have never been to one of these workshops, I am extrasensory. What that means is I couldn't fully plug into the matrix. Um, the majority of people, actually, let's go here. I want you to imagine that upon coming into your physical life here on the planet Earth, it's almost like plugging into a video game. But any of you who have played a video game know that you have an avatar, right? So usually there's an avatar in the video game that's kind of moving around for you and you're pretending you're that player. But in this time-space reality, coming into life is a bit like you become the avatar and totally forget the aspect of you that's sitting on the couch. And that actually benefits source consciousness that benefits the process of expansion for that forgetting process to occur so that you can fully engage in your three-dimensional life here. When I came into this time-space reality, I opted into several influences which made it so that that filter was broken. Um, one of them was that my mother had a rhesus factor that was different than mine. So she was RH negative blood factor and I was RH positive. So her body was attacking mine in the womb and at a very crucial phase when my nervous system was forming, I wasn't able to form well. So what it's like for me living is what it would be like for somebody if they took ayahuasca and then had to function normally. So yeah, I mean, just imagine being super high on ayahuasca every day but not pukey. That's my life, which was, quite frankly, hell growing up. I sort of like to joke about the fact that if I didn't do this work, I would literally be in an institution, which is pretty much the case. Like, I'm doing this work because it's literally the only thing for me, you know? Um, it's like watching 400 different TV channels at the same time, but the benefit of this is that I can see pre-manifested reality. I'm actually visually seeing, not like in the mind's eye, like visually seeing emotions. And I can see the human energy field. I can see inside bodies, I mean, all kinds of different stuff. When your dead relatives visit, I can see them. So being extrasensory, what I'm doing here in the crowd is I'm watching the collective consciousness. I will feel the rise and fall, and not just feel it, be able to visually see the rise and fall. If some of you don't get it, I'm also visually seeing it. 
So, <laughs> that was a little joke, you guys. So what's interesting that most people don't know is that you are all actually totally tapped into this collective unconscious. It's just most of you are not consciously aware of the fact that you're tapped into each other's subconscious. So there, this room represents a collective conscious that can be treated as one thing, like an individual entity, right? And the way that it looks is a little bit like an ocean or a body of water. Only if you could turn that water into pure light. And so I'm watching it kind of go between you two, or two, between all of you. And when somebody has a question that vibrates the closest to the collective asking, then that person in the crowd will light up. It's almost like somebody was to take a flashlight or a tiki torch or something and put it into their energy field. They just become super, super bright. And that means that the group is who selects who ends up on stage with me. Now, the fun of doing it this way, there's both fun and also practical application for this. The fun is, is I have no idea what the hell is going to happen when I go to a city. I don't know what a person's going to ask me. I don't know what their issue is. I don't know whether it's going to be somebody who comes up here and says, I want you to die. I don't. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's kind of like gamble chocolates. You guys got to have those here, right? Do you, have, do you have the chocolates? It's boxes of chocolates, you know? You get like the different flavors? Okay. Some people who come up here will challenge you. It will be very difficult for you. It'll probably personally trigger you. Other people will be super fun for you to watch. This is why I'm, I say that there's a practical application to doing these workshops this way, is that if you are a match to being in this room, then you have to be a match to the collective consciousness of this room. You couldn't actually be sitting here experiencing whoever is up here on stage with me if it didn't apply to you in some way. Your capacity to figure out how this applies to you is about your level of consciousness. Because it will be tempting sometimes for somebody who comes up here to say something and you'll be like, oh, I don't relate to that at all. I don't know why they're up there. This is not my thing. Like, I want to have my question answered. But actually, everything that happens on the stage has something for you. Absolutely everything. And I don't know whether it's something they're going to say, something I'm going to say, but your game today is to play the game of how does this apply to me. That's how you're going to suck the most um, for your own personal expansion out of whatever happens up here. And I'm going to help you with this. Sometimes when I'm helping them with a, a question, I will ask you guys to reflect on a question, for example. But that's how this is going to go. So don't take it personally if you, yourself, individually, don't get selected to come up here on stage by the group. It's not personal for me, and it's not personal, I can assure you, for anybody else in this audience. Put the intention out there, however, that whatever you want to know or need to know is going to come to you through the venue of myself and the person who's up on stage. And the other thing that I'm going to ask, because obviously being up here in such a vulnerable position, most people don't feel like I do about being on stage. I could literally fall asleep up here, like I gotta help myself. I, it's bad, like I was just saying when I was down here, I could curl up and go to sleep in front of you guys. Like my level of comfort in front of a crowd is not normal. <laughs> There's a reason though, do you wanna know the reason? In, in my childhood, everything that was horrible happened behind closed doors without anybody watching. So this actually is super safe to me. Graciela's teasing me. She's like, we're going to get you wallpaper of an audience so you can fall asleep at night. <laughs> <laughs> but for the majority of people, this is actually a higher fear than like anything. Did you know that? The number one fear in the world is actually public speaking. So not only am I requiring people to come up here and be in front of an audience of hundreds upon hundreds of people, I'm asking them to be open about their most vulnerable aspects in front of hundreds and hundreds of people. So what I want from you is to really put your undivided attention and unconditional presence towards the stage if you can today. Because what I can do is I can actually use the energy of the collective consciousness to create great shifts within people. So it's not just me that's going to be doing this magic today, it's also the focus from all of you. Do you want me to explain what unconditional presence means? 
Unconditional presence is one of the most important things you can learn when it comes to interacting with other people. It is that, this is the no conditions, doesn't matter whether you're happy, doesn't matter whether you're sad, doesn't matter whether you're doing this or doing that, there's no condition upon which I am present with you. Present means my focus is on you, I am completely feeling you, I'm completely listening to you. I'm coming to understand you. That's presence. So to give presence that is not conditioned upon anything is really, really awesome. Really, really awesome when it comes to developing relationships. And today is your opportunity to practice that with whoever is on stage. You guys ready to begin? Okay, you're going to have to bear with me because these stage lights have bathed everybody in a nice blood color. <laughs> so I'm hoping I can pick out what color people are actually wearing, which is usually how I identify people, but let's just give this a try, shall we? Okay, so get clear on whatever question you have in your mind, and when you have it, you can raise your hands. All right, you've selected straight where my hand is pointing, almost in the very last row, there is a, a man. Yeah, you're the only waving yes like this. You. Hey, it works, it's working. I'll also give you a little mild suggestion for those of you who end up here with me on stage. If you have a handheld microphone, you literally have to be close enough to make out with it for somebody to hear you on stage. Hi. Hello. <clears throat> so nice to see you in person. You too. You look very sparkly. <laughs> I like it. I couldn't resist. I did not expect to get picked. <laughs> so I just raised my hand and figured that if I get picked, there is something for the audience. What? <laughs> <laughs> I have two questions I've been thinking about lately. Okay. So how about I give them, okay. and then you can pick which one you perceive okay. to be the most relevant for the audience. Or you. Or for me. <laughs> okay. So my first question is regarding loneliness. Okay. Yeah. I rarely feel lonely. Is there something wrong with me? <laughs> What's your second question? That is question number one. <laughs> question number two is, what is the wisest way to deal with frustration and adversity? That's too broad. Let's go with the first question. The first one, all right. So where do we begin? There's something so wrong with you. <laughs> Did you say raw or wrong? I, I'm teasing you. Yeah? I said there's something seriously wrong with you. Mm -hmm. Okay, describe your life to me. Describe your day. My day? Yeah. Do you live with people or alone? Sorry? Do you live alone or with people? I live alone. My day is... I feel like a horse. I just... <clears throat> And the horse wants to get, get out and run. To do what? Run. But like to do what? Practically, because like, that's a horse. That's a horse, yeah. <laughs> and me running is working on projects and things I'm really passionate about. And I do love cuddling with the other horses. Okay. But then I want to go out and run. And this makes it so that I, I rarely feel lonely. Why is this a problem, though? I don't know. That's why I don't know why I'm here. <laughs> but I th that's the question I had. 
in my well, mind. Well, I know it's a question you had in your mind, but why did you have that question? I mean, like, you can only be asking that if you're having relationship issues. <laughs> yeah. So, when I've been in relationships, I enjoy my projects and more they, than I enjoy yes. my relationships. Exactly. And that makes them difficult yes. for them to work. Exactly. Yes. Um, okay, so, just for fun, I want you to start us off at the beginning. I'm going to work you through an understanding here. In your childhood, I want you to picture yourself at the dinner table. Can you do that? Yeah. Hmm. How much choice did you have over what you ate? I just ate whatever no one gave me. And I was, I was quite happy about that, I think. I ate a lot. <laughs> Always hungry. Talk to me about your family. <clears throat> what do you want to know? <laughs> I want you to describe them. What do they expect of you, first and foremost? Okay. My dad had expectations on me that I would be an achiever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So he really, because for him, school and education was very important. And he wanted me to be good at the same things that he was good at. Mm -hmm. So w what you just said is everything. I'm sorry I just set you up. But basically, I set you up to demonstrate my point here. Okay. Um, what you're working with and the reason that you don't feel lonely is because you have an avoidant attachment style. Have you ever heard about this before? A little bit. In your childhood, there's, a, there's two polarized opposite traumas. And I should get this out of the way right now and say that the majority of relationships actually on the planet today are dysfunctional. So when you hear somebody like myself or a psychologist or whatever talk about dysfunctional relationships, it is not the rarity. It is actually the norm. It's just that everybody has a family that falls somewhere on this dysfunction scale. You know, so For some people, it's like we're all the way over here where like dad's dead drunk and mom's like a super codependent and like bad enough maybe that like you know the mom walks in on a little girl getting sexually molested and is like, well, that... I didn't see that, you know, really dysfunctional. And then over here, somewhere over this way, we've got your type family, right? In that type of a family, when the children are born, the children are actually treated more like dolls. All of the children are treated like dolls because it's an expectation that they fit whatever the needs of the parents are. So for a minute, I want you to imagine that, imagine you're watching a little girl playing with a doll or a little boy in the case of your father. It's an expectation with the doll that if the little girl doesn't want to play with it anymore, she can put it on the shelf and it goes. And when the little girl decides she wants to feed it, it goes. You see? Watching a kid play um, house with a, a little doll, there's a striking difference between that and a real baby. And that's that that doll's on your schedule. That doll's dressing in what you want it to dress in. That doll has a future you want it to have. But with, a, with an actual human infant, it's the reverse. It's this little being comes in and is like, I'm taking a crap in my diaper now, regardless of whether it's 3 a.m. or not. I want to eat now. I want to eat this thing versus that thing. I want to wear this thing versus that thing. And I have my own potential and purpose. So there, there begins this war. Because when a, a little child has their own identity, it often invalidates the desires or even the entire personality of the parent. This is where your dad came in. If you had a um, penchant for, to be a musician, and maybe that was your purpose coming in, that would fly in the face of everything your father values. So he has a choice right now. Either he, he accommodates your values 
or he says, you replace your values for my values. Now, in our childhood, and even in our adulthood, our single biggest need is connection and closeness. And I, I cannot stress this more, because all of us have to get this on the globe, or else we're not going to get each other. A human infant is, in the animal world, an absolute embarrassment in terms of you know, independence, because it is completely relationally dependent. If you put a three-month-old baby on the floor and you don't feed it and do what you're doing with it, that is a dead infant. And that's at three months. We are born three months premature, actually, because we couldn't actually fit through the birth canal. So we come out unformed, actually, to be honest. And even after that, you've got something that's completely dependent on mom and dad. Now, that's survival that you're talking about. That is the most primal aspect of the nervous system that prioritizes closeness with the social group above all else because that is the only way to live. So I want you to get that about yourselves. You are programmed 100% and physiologically to need other people. It is a bigger need than food and water because it is what guaranteed you food and water. <laughs> so as a child, this is why you'll see somebody like me keep pulling people back to childhood over and over and over again. It's not because I'm on some vendetta against parents. It's <laughs> I keep pulling you back there because it's your programming. This is the foundation of your imprinting. It was way back in those days that you laid the foundation for what you are. And at your most primal essence, you are in need of closeness. So, can you accept that so far? Yes. So when you have a parent that says, my approval and closeness with you is completely dependent upon you giving yourself up for me, you do it. You figure out a way to do it. which is how we arrive at your attachment style. And by the way, we can talk about the opposite attachment style if you'd like in a minute, because all the children are expected to be dolls. Some succeed at it, <laughs> others don't. <laughs> the ones who succeed at it, both of us, I mean, right now we're actually representing in our family and it's the exact opposite roles. What we represent is two children who are both expected to be dolls. One made it and one didn't, right? It created two opposite styles and relationships because both of us would have gotten the message, you can't have me and have you too. So when, when dad is like, you can't have yourself, and this, this learning happens so early, like so early, a lot of these memories you don't even really have a lot of access to anymore. It's just a vague feeling. When dad says, you can't have you and have me too, you gave yourself up for it, knowing that the consequence would be being isolated and ostracized like I was. And what I did was watch you, the kid who did make it work, feeling totally ostracized and isolated, realizing that to be close, I would have to lose myself. So we're both terrified of each other's fate. But he, Let's explain you. When you get close to somebody, you lose yourself. Because it's the way you learn to have relationship. So when you, the closer you get, the more suffocated you're going to feel, the more you're going to feel like you need space. And what you get out of your projects is a feeling of being an individual. Does that make sense? Yeah. You don't have a very defined sense of self, actually. Which is probably the opposite of what most people have told you. They, they probably tell you you're a super narcissist, like you're just focused on yourself all the time, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's a form of rebellion, is what you're doing. You guys understand there's a difference between freedom and rebellion, right? Rebellion is not freedom. With rebellion, you're still completely at the mercy of whatever you're rebelling against. 
So they'll look at you and say, you've got a really defined sense of self, like consider other people for once in your life. But actually, you're in a constant fight to try to define yourself. Because your inclination, because that's how you've been taught, the minute that you get close to somebody you're in relationship and begin to get intimate, you suddenly are losing track of your needs versus their needs, your wants versus their wants, preferences. It's like it, it starts to diffuse. Do some of you relate to this? <laughs> so when you start to feel that feeling in your body, it actually, that will threaten your sense of identity, which is also a form of survival. And so you will run away to go be alone. But the reason that you're not feeling the sense of isolation so intensely, the way that somebody with the opposite attachment style might feel, is because you don't have those boundaries. Which boundaries? A sense of self. Do you understand boundaries? Do you guys want me to talk about boundaries? <laughs> okay. I love talking about boundaries because no one gets them. Actually, first, let's play with this. If I was to say, talk to me about boundaries, like define what, what is a boundary, what would you say? Just out of curiosity. First of all, I think it would be interesting to talk about it because I think me being more skilled at putting up boundaries would allow me to feel more safe Definitely. when I'm with other people. But, yes. but that's, oh God, you're so, I'm so glad you're up here. I cannot even tell you. <laughs> you, you were like the perfect example. So do you, do you hear what he said? I really want to be able to put up boundaries. And do you, do you see that against movement? That is classic of this attachment style. And, and this, most of us, by the way, I set you up again to be, you know, in a normal world, if I ask anybody what boundaries are about, they always describe that, you know, boundaries are related to almost like a barrier or a push you away, right? So can I try again? You didn't fail. It's just, well, I guess, I, go ahead, yeah. I'm interested. No, no, I trust you. <laughs> okay, so most people associate boundaries only with a conflict. So boundaries are about when you push somebody away or when you say no. That's not a boundary, you guys. A boundary is nothing more than a defined sense of self. So you understand definition, right? If you imagine static, imagine static on a screen. And when that static starts to condense into a picture of a person, they start to become defined in that static, right? So a boundary is nothing more than what defines you. It's that simple. So, you ready for a boundary? Yes. This is my favorite. What's your favorite ice cream? You guys do eat ice cream here, right? <laughs> okay. I do now. There is... <laughs> There's one with no sugar in it called Nix. It's amazing. I need to find this. How I found it? No, I need to find this ice cream. Like, this yeah, is it's my awesome. favorite thing. Yeah, it's with xylitol and stuff. It's great. Okay. Yeah. Nix. So what's your favorite flavor? It's, um, I can't translate it. It's like a... You can't translate it? I don't know the English word. Koala. Grab koala. Fudge. Fudge, right. Fudge. Mm. You're lush, aren't you? <laughs> um, my favorite's coffee. That's a boundary. Sit with that for a minute. Isn't that incredible? My favorite is coffee and his is fudge. That's a boundary. The only point at which we start to become concerned with boundaries and relationships is when there's a conflict. Here's an example. You and I are in a relationship. You want to go work on a project, right? Mm -hmm. That defines him. Right now, his desires, so you get that. A definition is my needs, my desires, my preferences, my thoughts, my feelings. So right now, in this moment, his feeling is he wants to go work on a project. My feeling is I would like to cuddle, and then some. <laughs> That's a boundary conflict. Do you see that? So right now our sense of self and what we need, it doesn't match. So what would you do typically in a relationship in that scenario? When this happen? Yeah. I would say, Tila, I see that you want to cut it right now. <laughs> <laughs> that would be lovely. 
I want to work on my project. Can we do this another time? Would that be okay with you? Okay, so, so, so what's the problem? Do you guys feel the problem there or no? Do I need to spell this out? What you literally just said is, Teal, I see your need. My need is more important. So I'm going to put it first. There, what you didn't do is open the door for me because you never learned that this could happen in the past. And this is really important if you have this attachment style. You never learned that somebody else was capable of considering your best interests. So you never actually opened the door for me to allow for your need. So, so a relationship with you is a war. If you get anything today, that's the thing I need you to get. Because it, it, it will totally transform your relationships if you get this. Your relationships today are a war. It's you or me. Do you notice that? In your mentality, and watch this in yourselves if you've got this issue. In your mind, you win right now or I win right now. Right? Either I get you to stay home and cuddle and then some, or you get me to let you go. Do you feel this energy? Yeah. This is called a zero-sum game. Do you want me to explain zero-sum games? I did come from America after all. <laughs> okay, you guys, that was way, way more of a laugh than that. <laughs> come on. It'll be more funny when I explain what a zero-sum game is. A zero-sum game is I win, you lose. And we're actually playing these games in relationships all the time and not really realizing it. But it makes trust impossible. So let's talk about trust, shall we? I can define trust for you in about a second here. Trust is I can rely upon you to capitalize on my best interests. This is important for you to notice. I didn't say I can rely upon you to give up your best interests for my best interests. Because, because that's, when, we, when we've got your attachment style, that's what we start to think. We start to think that to, to develop trust, we have to give ourselves up for the other person. That's your education in childhood, right? That's not what I said. Trust is, I can rely upon you to capitalize on my best interests. That means to consider my best interests. A relationship which is founded on trust is founded upon the principle that because we are in a relationship, your best interests are part of my best interests and vice versa. So there is no possible way that I could damage you without hurting myself. And if you do the same thing in return, then you're considering my best interests as well, then both of us are actually making space for our needs, wants, thoughts, feelings, and boundaries. Does that make sense so far? Yeah. I, I need this to be so practical before you get off the stage, though it's ridiculous. Because like, sometimes when I'm having these philosophical conversations about the reality of the planet Earth, it doesn't make sense in practice, right? You guys with me so far? Yeah. If I, in this committed relationship, if we were in this scenario, if I hear you say, I really want to work on a project, that's your best interest, which is part of mine, right? Now I want to make the space for you to do that. I also want you to make the space for me to be, you know, loved. Can you do that? Yeah. Okay, so then what we do is we sit down and we have a conversation about it. We're going to role play. All right, all right. Okay, so, so say it again. Say it like you're actually going to take my best interest as part of yours. You understand this is aggressive. It's literally t choosing with your free will. This is a big important thing, okay? For somebody who's in your shoes, it might not actually be the place that you're in in the healing process to actually be in relationship. I, I really need to make that clear because sometimes, sometimes there's this assumption that... Um, because the ultimate form of human life is to really be in committed and intimate relationship, that that's the most healthy thing for somebody to do. If you've had enmeshment trauma to a serious degree, 
You know that period in your 20s, at least in America, in your 20s there's this period where you're supposed to be just like super self-centered, you know? So it's the time that you go to spring break and like you go and you change your major 400 times in college and um, that phase where you don't have to consider anybody else's best interests might be really important for you. I want to put that on the table as a potential. Because what will happen after a person really feels that they get to choose with their free will to have complete independence, they will then choose into relationship. And so instead of sort of fighting the other person, they're like, okay, well, I choose to take your best interest as part of my own. Where do you think you might be, by the way? Because I don't want to like shove you into this next practice and if you think that this might be a good thing for you to have this hiatus of considering anyone else. <laughs> I'll get there sooner or later, so it's it's good to to practice the role playing. Okay, but can I can you just can you maybe restate what I said to you though about where you might be? What is the most relevant place for me to be in my healing journey? You mean? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And currently, I desire to explore freedom and independence. Perfect. Okay, so this is what it looks like if you're going to do that for now. Yeah. It means that, that what matters, you try not to hurt the hell out of other people in general, but you're not committing to a relationship, so you don't want to lead a woman on into thinking that she's going to. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like if you ever engage in a sexual relationship, for example, you literally from the get-go say, this is literally only a sexual relationship, but you've got to really feel into a woman because let's just be honest, we lie. I'm calling some of you out because, girls, if a guy says to you, I'm literally just going to like full on outright tell you this. If a guy says, I'm literally only in this for sex, he is literally never going to change his mind, okay? Because what we love to do as girls is be like, oh my God, me too. It's just like, you know, it's just fun. But like in the back of our head, it's like, wedding bells? I think I know the dress I'm wearing. We cannot be like this anymore, okay? So, making some accommodation for the fact that women are generally terrible at taking a man at his word. Um, <laughs> I, I need you to really be honest with women during this period so you damage as little amount of people as you can. But when you're in this phase, you're actually going through what a toddler needs to go through, which is being able to say no being able to pick only what it wants. You know, it's that whole independence phase. So you're gonna go after what you want, you're gonna think what you think, you're gonna pay attention to your feelings, you're gonna make decisions based on you. It's like a complete autonomy phase until you feel like you wanna consciously choose into a relationship. Then, when you wanna choose into a, a relationship consciously, do you, do you see how I choose to take your best interest as part of my best interest makes you free. Yeah. This is a big deal for you guys to get this. You, you don't have to. No one's forcing you to, to consider somebody else's best interests. You're choosing to do it, which means that nobody took your power away at all. So, let's do this. You're in the relationship. Okay. You choose with your free will to take my best interests as part of your own. If you are capable of intimacy, you've already felt into and seen into me. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna evaluate what you see and feel in me and what you see and feel in yourself. And there's always gonna be a little bit of pliability then. Do you see what I mean? Pliability. Yeah. yeah. Pliability being, you know, if, if my best interests include hers, it's not just me considering her best interest. They're actually part of my own. I'm not going to feel good going to, to do my project at this particular minute, knowing she feels that way. So could you say the last part again? I didn't hear you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh. <laughs> All right. Actually, I'll reverse it on him, and then he'll get it. I'll reverse it. Ready? If I'm taking your best interests as part of my own, mm. not just considering your best interests, right? It's not, it's like, look, I'm gonna show you like this, right? Mm -hmm. 
this is your best interest. Mm -hmm. Now, to consider your best interest, right, I'm like, okay, well, that's yours. This is more aggressive. It's to choose with my free will to take your best interest as part of mine. Mm. Now, if you say, I want to go do a project, it's part of my own best interest. So it's not going to feel good for me if you're trapped at home, is it? No. That's how you stay safe in a relationship. It's not going to feel good for me if, I'm, if I've got you stuck here any more than it's going to feel good for you if you're gone and I'm miserable at home, right? Mm. So you and I are going to engage in a process now at this point that looks like what's the third option? Now, if you're really connected to somebody, this conversation isn't even something that has to take place as a conversation. You're going to be able to feel me enough to kind of evaluate your needs and my needs so that you can find a third option that makes us both feel good. Maybe on this day, you going at all is a bad idea. Maybe going in two hours is a good idea. Maybe going now and then meeting up for lunch is a good idea. It depends on the scenario. But we're gonna go back and forth until we find out what that is where both of us feel a sensation of relief, not sacrifice. That's the most important flavor difference to notice. Please, baby. Okay, okay. Oh, this is a personal trigger for me. Oh, my God. All right. <laughs> All right. Can I tell you why? <laughs> because people of opposing attachment styles attract. And so what happens is the people who desperately need you around all the time will end up in relationships with you. And you will end up with people who desperately need you all the time. And then we always feel unloved and unwanted. And you always feel suffocated. This is exactly what happened. <laughs> <laughs> Until I broke up with her about two months ago. Mm -hmm. Well, do you want me to tell you the truth? Psychologists today consider this the deathly dynamic. Like, if you walk into a psychologist's office who practices attachment theory, some of them won't even see you. If they know that you have the anxious attachment and the avoidant attachment, they will literally just say, my friends, it's a matter of time. Bye. Do you want me to tell you why? Yeah. Because you're, you're both always in the red zone. What I mean by that is that you're, because you're always feeling suffocated in the relationship, because of your trauma around intimacy. Um, anytime there's closeness in the relationship, it pulls your nervous system into fight or flight. That's the red zone. And because you're constantly pushing away because of it, it pulls my nervous system always into the red zone. I'm constantly in fight or flight. And so it's a volatile relationship that's full of addiction patterns. <coughs> you start to become actually abusive because you said what's called a, an um, intermittent reinforcement pattern. Could you explain that? Yeah. You guys interested? Okay, in the intermittent reinforcement pattern, let's say that you live on this, but in this case, it's intimacy, right? So what, the, what this person is after is this closeness, this feeling of juicy closeness, right? So come here. Just, you have a little collection of these, okay? The entire relationship between somebody with your style and somebody with my style of attachment, which is all you're going to find so far, is determined by you. The avoidant is in control of the relationship, and some of you who are on this end of the spectrum, you know how horrible this feels. The relationship is always controlled by the person who can pull away, because a relationship... It's like, I want you to imagine there's a kiddie pool in between us of water. To have a relationship, I have to, with my free will, step into that kiddie pool. And you have to step in too. I'm totally at the mercy of that. So if what I need is your closeness, and that's what a relationship is, right? Then I'm at the mercy of your capacity to go. And the avoidant is the one that can do it. So we basically sit here at the castle door that's mostly closed, waiting for you to open. 
this is where intermittent reinforcement comes in. And by the way, it's the most powerful addiction pattern you can get into. This is closeness, one of those rocks. You get to decide when you give this, don't you? Because it's not one of your dominant needs. It's suppressed. <laughs> so what's going to happen is I'm going to be constantly bidding. Imagine that I'm like a little mouse right now. I'm going to bid like all day. <laughs> now, he sometimes is going to just randomly feel good enough to go, oh. okay, so maybe that day, if we were in a relationship, that day we had sex. <laughs> now I'm bidding again. Do you, see, you notice that there's no pattern here. This is what makes this addictive. I can't find a pattern for what makes him come forward into the relationship and actually give me the intimacy that I need. So then I keep pressing, and this actually, see, I start getting into a starvation pattern because I can't figure out how to get him to be close. Now then, maybe next time, he kisses me on the cheek, and I'm like, okay, it's better again. Now, if you're in this type of an addictive pattern, that will cause instantaneous relief. And I'm recommitted, completely recommitted, but then you go away again. You get emotionally distant, you want to go do a project, so each time you do this, I get more frantic until pretty soon, like, I'm actually completely smothering you because it's like, it gets, instead of doing this, it's like... Because now there's, there's no predictable pattern. And so it becomes a full-blown addiction. And I mean very serious. Like, some would say more powerful than heroin, actually. Because when, when I'm in this type of a mode, my body is giving off certain chemicals. And when you hand me one of those... <gasps> it's a whole other chemical cascade. Which includes endorphins, which are more addictive to the human body than opioids. It is one. <laughs> Do you understand that so far? Yeah, and I recognize myself yeah. a lot in it. So the first thing you got to get, and this is why I'm saying, like, you have a lot of responsibility in relationships here to, to not be the one who tortures, because... If what we were having a conversation about was how to not have a relationship and how to be independent, the person in the hot seat would be the one in the anxious attachment style. That would be the person that I'd be like, okay, you gotta fix this little issue here, but, but the reason that you're, you gotta be the central focus is because a relationship is about choosing to be together, not apart. Does that make sense? So you, that's something you need to know. In your relationships, because your attachment style, actually the relationship is at the mercy of you. That should make you feel a little better, too, though. Because you're used Why? to... Because in childhood, you were powerless to your relationships. Especially with mom and dad. That's why you got into this whole thing. You look confused. I am confused, yeah. But... Why? But in a good way. I think, I think you're really describing what yeah. has been going on in my life. Yes. And... I don't feel so good about being, uh, about having this power. I, good. Yeah, because I don't trust myself yet. Well, but that's the thing though, I mean, you are actually healing from an addictive relationship style. The avoidant and anxious is an addictive style. So just like an addict has a day where they go, crap, I'm like completely at the mercy of my addiction. When you're in this type of relationship pattern, that's the day you're having, and that's actually a good day. It's the day where you actually realize the reality. The reality is you are, you know, you have been completely out of control, honestly. You've been at the mercy of your own attachment style. So you haven't actually been picking partners that are right for you any more than if I was in this relationship, I would be picking a partner who's right for me, you know. We're basically going for the heroin needle. Both of us. Does that make sense, Kenna? Yeah. I, I, I don't really need this to feel amazing. I need it to feel like, okay, I gotta be way care, more careful in the relationships that I get into. And, and here's just a little tip. Like, once you start into relationships again, if you have your type of pattern, the person you pick is really important because you are gonna need to rehabilitate yourself in relationships. You guys get that, right? 
you're gonna actually need to rehabilitate yourself. And this is where I completely freaking disagree with the majority of experts on the planet. The majority of experts think that this is, you know, they say this is a death sentence, but then they, they're basically saying, you need to learn how to be closer, right? And you, people in this chair, need to learn how to give people more space. Are you guys sort of, have you heard that before or no? It's BS. Do you want me to tell you why? Okay, to heal. To heal is to experience the opposite, right? And when it comes to the traumas that we experience in our childhood, that's the experience. So to heal is the opposite of the experience. What is the experience that caused me to be traumatized in childhood if I have this attachment style? Abandonment. What is his? Enmeshment. What is the opposite for each of us? He needs to, so if he's been enmeshed, he needs complete autonomy. That's why I'm saying for him to choose this period of time where he's like, it's only me and mine and whatever, right, is healthy for right now. Before you choose, if you want to, into a relationship. What's healing for the person who's been abandoned? Total and complete closeness. So this is not somebody, if you're on this side of the spectrum, your opposite experience is not to learn how to give people space. It's not, oh, you were abandoned when you were little? Learn how to give people space. <laughs> what, what you need to do is be incredibly selective in choosing a partner who can be with you all the time. I mean, what would be the best if I could design it? If people were in this type of a, um, attachment style, the best for you would actually be to start a business together even. And to have a kind of a relationship you can't do that where it's like guaranteed you're gonna be together. Where it becomes so, the closeness becomes so predictable that it actually pulls your nervous system out of fight or flight. You get the opposite experience from what you have experienced. And then by virtue of doing that, you're gonna naturally create more autonomy. So that's where the health starts to come into play. And we've already figured this out in the psychology field. This is called the paradox effect, where ironically, the closer that a couple is, the more autonomy they can tolerate. But when a couple gets into to crisis, gets into conflict, they can tolerate much less autonomy. So the more secure and the more closeness you can guarantee somebody, especially who's been in this position, the more that they're okay with space. And that's gonna be your best friend when you get into a relationship. Because for you, let me show you physiologically, okay? If somebody that you're in a relationship, oh wait, I gotta go here first. You need to pick somebody who is okay with distance. Just like I, if I'm in this role, like I need to pick somebody who's like, dude, my life is about you, man. You need to pick somebody who likes distance in relationships, okay? But even then, if you get a woman who clings at any point, how do you respond to this? I'm teaching you the paradox effect. Your first instinct is to pull away, isn't it? I'm, I'm gonna save your life here in relationships. Do the opposite. It's really hard for you, isn't it? Look at you. <laughs> You're making me anxious. God, man. Hold your hand. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He doesn't mean it. <laughs> See, do you, do you feel this? Like, even though he made that physiological move, like, his, all his energy is like... But, but, but practice is like, actually try to come forward. Like, try with your energy. But, but, <laughs> See, I, I have sympathy for this. Can I tell you why I have sympathy for this? You're like this because of trauma. You've learned that this means death to come forward, so I understand that this is carrying the living daylights out of you. I get it. But the more forward you come, Actually, I'm just going to sit here until you can do it. Feel the fear. 
You're going to have to feel the fear. And when you feel ready, just energetically come towards me. When you can, don't rush yourself. There we go. Do you feel how that just relaxed me? Mm -hmm. I, I wasn't yanking on you so intensely because you did that. So the paradox, this is the paradox effect. I'm going to show it to you visually. The paradox effect is, if somebody is pulling for closeness and you come closer, they relax. So actually, for people like you, that is, that is your greatest self-save mechanism in a relationship. If you come closer to the person who is clinging, they can tolerate autonomy. Cool, huh? So do you get this or no? I get it, yeah. Okay. What is your most avoidant attention? Yes. Oh, dear Lord. <laughs> Hi, Matthias. <laughs> this doesn't apply to you at all, does it? <laughs> if, you're both, if, you, if you have a disorganized attachment, which is what is that that's called, this is just about, this is literally just about trauma. The disorganized attachment only happens in situations where there is enough of a threat to your um, immediate safety, usually physically or sexually or emotionally or all of the above. It's perpetrator bonding. So what we're calling disorganized attachment, oh my God, I knew I was going to get into this. You guys, I'm in Stockholm. Do you guys like study this in school or is this like? <laughs> All right, I'm, go I'm just gonna go there, I'm sorry. This is like really not politically correct to do, but I'm doing it. Um, I'm in Stockholm where they came up with this little syndrome, which, <laughs> yeah. Um, you guys know the story, right? Do I have to tell you the whole story? Okay, no. Um, stay here for me for a second, and I'm going to have somebody else come up. Matthias, come up here for me. Can you do that? i got to use a guy. I'm t okay, keep me on track. I'm talking disorganized attachment here. All right. <clears throat> I'm going to explain to you how disorganized attachment forms and how it's actually really just Stockholm Syndrome. If I'm in a situation, this is a captive situation, and by the way, the fir come here. The first thing that you have to um, accept is that your childhood is actually captivity. I know that we don't want to accept this because we love children, and I hear that Swedes especially love children. So we don't want to look at childhood the way that it is, but in childhood, you're actually in a prison. Your happiness in your childhood is completely dependent upon the benevolence of your keepers. That's mom and dad, and how well they can attach to your, or even perceive your needs and wants and preferences and how you're feeling and thinking. But if they can't, you're like really out of luck because you're captive in that household. I mean, the state's not gonna come in if you have parents that are just emotionally avoidant and take you away from them, nor would you really want them to, honestly. But short to say, like you're not gonna run away from home at three, are you? So your house, that's your prison. Now, when you're with somebody who is a dangerous individual, this is a person who cannot consider my best interests. That's the first thing to get, okay? This person cannot consider my best interests. It's literally all about them and their wants. And I am trapped in a house. What is the safest place to be? Because when I'm out here trying to get away, what's he doing? Is this safe or not? Okay, so what's safe? This is safe. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna endear myself to this person in every way that I can. I'm gonna start to mirror them. They don't consider me anyways. So I'm going to start to fool this person, basically, placate them into thinking that I am exactly what they are. I have the same thoughts as you, I have the same feelings as you, my life is about you, and we're completely on the same page. Now when I do that, he goes and relaxes. 
But what's happening in my body right now is that I need this closeness for my survival. I'm, I'm obviously, I'm human. I still have that. And I especially need this one because if I don't have, I mean, he controls my entire life, right? So I need that closeness, but at the same time, like, what am I really wanting to do but I can't do because I'm captive? I'm wanting to run. So with, this is what gives rise to a disorganized attachment. It's at the same time as I want to be close, I want to run away as fast as I can. And this is torture in relationships. It is the hardest pattern to work with because anytime you're in close vicinity with somebody, you go straight back into this pattern. And so even if you're with like a technically nice person, which you probably won't be a match to if you have that um, attachment style to begin with, even if you're with a really nice person, you start to sort of turn them into this. So the way to rehabilitate this is a, it's a very slow process. It's almost like, have any of you seen people work with damaged dogs or horses? Let's pretend that he's a, a, a really super flighty, been beaten type of dog, right? You want me to do it with a horse? I'm a horse, yeah. Oh. Thank you. Okay, if he's a really damaged, a super damaged horse, what I'm going to start doing is I'm going to start recording our successes in tiny little itty bitty increments. So the first thing I might do, if you're a horse, this is a whole different deal for us. Go back to my days of training. I'm not looking at you to begin with. I'm not squaring off with you because as a horse, if I do this, I'm now a predator. So when I'm walking around you, I'm not going to be looking directly at you to begin with. I'm going to be letting you know, and my whole body posture is going to be that I'm safe. Now, at this point, you're probably running around and going nuts until the moment that you shift and turn your body towards me. If a horse does that in a pen, so like at first you'll see him sort of doing this, and then there will be a moment where they go. That one little look is so important. It means their energy came towards you for the very first time. Now, when you're trying to train a horse in this way, anytime they give you that tiny little indication that they're coming towards you, there's a reward of some sort, like the pressure's taken off. So if I was walking towards him like this and he's running around, if he turns towards me, I go, I remove the pressure. And if we're working on a lead line, it's the same thing. Tension, tension, release of tension. So, so this person's getting a reward for coming closer. And that actually teaches the nervous system in a very somatic way that it's safe to come into relationship in that case. So as this applies to humans, when somebody has a disorganized attachment, what they need worse than anything is somebody who can sit here with them. Let's pretend you're a person with disorganized attachment in this case. And what they are going to say and do is, I'm here and I'm not going to come into your bubble. I'm also not going to leave. And, and that will put pressure on them. There will be anxiety, but eventually there's going to... You usually see a breakdown, actually, in that person. Because it's the first time that they've never... They've had somebody who's committed to not doing either abandonment or a forward-moving transgression. So in our relationships, let's say that I'm, I'm working with somebody with a disorganized attachment. If they're in a relationship with somebody or even not, the first thing I'll have them do is lay down on a bed together just like that, next to each other. You guys are interested in this, right? I'm not like losing my whole crowd? Okay. I'll have them lay down on a bed next to each other, and then it's the person who has the disorganized attachment that gets to initiate the closeness. That's the important part. So the other person isn't going away with their attention either. It's not like they're daydreaming on the bed next to you. It's like their focus is actually on the person next to them. And they're completely with the other person, but they're also not you know, coming over and, and infiltrating in any way. So the person who has the disorganized attachment is then the one that reaches out their hand maybe, and they can practice a few times. Like if we're working with somatic, you know, body work, which is so good for trauma, they'll maybe reach over their hand and then touch and it's scary and so they can pull it back. But that doesn't cause the person to go away at all. And then they try it again and then eventually you can have a sort of safe relationship where they're the ones that are initiating the level of closeness or distance. And it's really amazing what happened. I mean, that's just the beginning. This is like a long process that I probably can't go into completely here, but 
Um, it's very powerful for a person who has the disorganized attachment to have the capacity to choose their level of closeness or distance for the first time and to realize there's no consequences for it. Because what a person with a disorganized attachment learns is that there's a consequence for everything. And so they, it's like hell in relationships because they're like, well, if I'm not close, you're going to go away. But I can't handle you to be that close, you know, because of the terror. So that's the general way how to rehabilitate that. Where are we? Do you need to know anything else? Do you still want to do the role ro play? Well, I guess. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's pretend we were in a relationship. But you have to take that, what I said to you about the paradox effect, never forget it, about the paradox effect. Keep it in mind when we do this. Give me another scenario. A conflict between you and me. <clears throat> okay, let's say that you want the dishes to be clean when you get home from work, and I don't want to do that. Is that too simple? Would no, that work? it's fine, it's fine, let's do it. Okay. This is more of a normal thing, it doesn't involve our attachment style, so thank you. <gasps> <laughs> All right. Or do you want something with the attachment style? No, it's fine. Okay. <laughs> I want all the dishes to be done, and you don't want to do them. Okay, so I see that, that you don't want to be doing the dishes. Why is it that you don't want to do the dishes? So because I'm taking his best interest as part of mine, I'm trying to understand him. This is how we have a relationship. I want to feel you, I want to hear you, and I want to understand you. Mm. Why don't you want to do the dishes? Because when I'm going about my day, yeah. I like to be focused on what I'm doing, yeah. and then when I'm done with my day, then I'll do the dishes in the end before I go to bed. Why? Because I want to be in the flow during the day. Why? Because otherwise I get distracted. And what does that do to you? That makes me think about other things than what I'm focused on. Okay, do you know what your issue is? Yeah. You're not getting vulnerable enough for me to care. Do you know what I mean by that? I think I do. Relatability, especially women, I mean this, is, this goes for, this is unanimously about people, but especially women. Most women, unless you're dealing with a full on nutcase, they really care about pain. So you're going to have to involve me, and why does that create a problem for you, like painful? Not just like, I don't want to. Do you, do you, watch my tone of voice. I just want to be in the flow. I want to be in the flow, and when I want to be done with something, I want to be done with something. That was almost a, like... <laughs> I mean, we're fighting already. Mm. Let me into your pain. This is where a relationship begins, for you especially. Why is that a problem if, you, if it distracts you from what you're doing? Why is that, why is that a problem? Because I feel really, really good when I'm completely absorbed by something. Okay. And, and when you're not. And when I'm not. I feel distracted and I'm feeling like I'm not being as useful as I could be. And when you're not as useful as you could be? Then I feel like I'm wasting myself. And when you're wasting yourself, why would that be so bad? Because then I feel like I'm not taking responsibility. And when you're not taking respect. <laughs> Look at how avoidant you are of vulnerability. I want you guys to recognize yourself in this. There are some of you who fit this bill. He's not being vulnerable with me. Can you tell? Okay. Keep going. Why would it be so bad? To waste yourself. Just then I would feel, I would feel useless. I would feel bad. And if you're useless, why is that so bad? 
because then I feel like I have no value. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, so what I'm hearing in this relationship is that if, if you do the dishes before I get home, you feel like you have no value. Yeah. To who? I would be curious about to who. But like in this case, I'm not even asking that because I'm challenging it. To who? Useless to who? Because obviously you'd be useful to me doing that. <laughs> I'm a bit confused right now. <laughs> That's good. I've yeah. taken you out of your comfort zone. Yeah, you have. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want me to fill in the blanks for you? Yes, please. Which I can pretty much guarantee a girlfriend won't be able to do for you, but I'm going to do it for you. I feel useless because in my childhood, my dad made me believe that if I wasn't doing certain things, I was a complete waste to society, and washing dishes was not one of those things. You got it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so then, this is interesting because that shows you that you have something to work on. On your own. Yeah, do you get but that? No, but I'm showing you a relationship. What, what do you want to know? S sorry? I want to show you what a relationship is like. You're going to take me on a wild goose chase now. Okay, okay. Here you go. That told you something. You're in the business of awakening, otherwise you wouldn't show up today, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so then that told you something interesting. You're still operating from a, a previous belief that was implanted by Dad. If I do the dishes, what does that mean about me? No, that's just something to look at. Like, it's not even something you have to solve right now, but it's just interesting to notice that about yourself. You know, ooh, I'm really operating from this interesting sort of a judgment pattern. Now, how to, for me, being an, an, into the awareness business, it's sort of like, okay, well, what does that mean about how I treat people who wash dishes in, in restaurants? I'm, if I have that belief, I can guarantee you that you are looking at them with the same sort of philosophy. No, if you're committed to reducing suffering, then you know that would be an issue for me if I was in your position. But it's about looking at that. Is it true? You know, and that whole exploration. But that's like for you to do. If I'm in a relationship with you and you just said that, I don't want you to be in pain in that way. If I care about you and I love you, there's no way I'd want you to be washing dishes, feeling like a use, useless person and a failure, which is what you feel like. So. Can I let you in? So I'm taking that as part of my reality, right? Can you take me as part of yours? I'll do my best. When I come home from work and what I see is a bunch of dishes in the sink, I feel like I have to take responsibility for that also. And so I'm going to stress about it as long as it's in the sink. And I feel like I can't go on to doing anything else unless that's done which is so much stress. It's like the pr I feel the pressure in my body everywhere. So when there is distraction around you, you feel like you can't relax when you come home. And being able to relax yes. is important to you. And the dishes are distraction, because if I wanted to relax and there's dishes in the sink, that's all I'm thinking about. Mm. Oh, God, oh, God. How distracted are you? <laughs> Like, really distracted. Really? Okay, why does but it's it make, not, but what, it's not even distraction. Like, distraction's your word. My word is pressure. It's and like, why do you feel pressure? Because it's responsibility. But why do you feel responsible about it? Because I don't trust you to do it, is the truth. Why don't you trust So me? I feel like it's going to fall on me again. And... Do you feel like I, I never do it, even though I say, say I will? No, it's, it's always a fight. Like, I feel like the reason you do it is always because I make you do it. I feel like if I didn't get you to do it, it would never be done. Mm. So you feel like you have to take responsibility for me? Yes. Okay. 
how often do you feel like you can trust me? <laughs> Almost never. And what could I do to make you trust me more? Well, let's say that, I, so right now, taking both of our, so this is where we're, we're in the pattern right now of trying to find the third option, right? I'm showing you what to do in relationships. We've both seen the vulnerable truth, right? What I need, I'm aware now, out of looking at that, what I need is for you to take full-blown responsibility for those dishes without me asking. But I don't want to force you to do that in a way that's going to make you feel useless. I mean, if you don't want to do the dishes at all, we have to have a little conversation about that, maybe even. Is that a boundary of yours? Let's pretend that it is. Yeah. <laughs> for this <disrupt>, eh? <clears throat> Well, then I want you to take the responsibility of finding somebody else to do it. By the way, if you want to know how really successful people think, this is how they start thinking. I don't want to do that job, so I'm going to do more of what I love doing so that I can pay for someone to do that job. But I don't want to be responsible for that as your woman. So... When I'm in a relationship and you and I have two needs where we don't have a consensus, mm -hmm. how, if I want you to feel more close to me and I want to feel more close to you... No, you just did it. Sorry? Why are you asking me that question? You just did it. I feel closer to you when you include me in your vulnerability. Mm. If you've got a major conflict or an issue, it, there's some pain underneath it. And when you include me in that, I'm included in your life. You made it happen already. Mm. And then, and then the, even amping it up and the cherry on top is, what is the third option? Mm. How do we accommodate for each other? We're accommodating for each other. This is what a relationship is. It's not compromise. It's not compromise. Compromise is horrible. Strike it from your vocabulary. What compromise is, is I'll take some pain and you take some pain. That's not what we're after. We're after the solution that causes both of us to feel relief and as if we're closer. And I don't really see the difference between compromise and accommodation. That's because you're not taking my best interests as part of yours yet. Do you, do you guys, do you guys are, you, are any of you getting this or no? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, again. Yeah. If I am going to take your best interests as part of my best interests, this is now part of me. I don't feel relief unless you feel relief. So it's not a compromise for me, is it? I don't feel like I'm self-sacrificing when this is part of my best interests. I, w I need you, I need you to feel good. That's my best interests. I've just chosen that with my free will. You haven't yet. The reason that this is confusing you is because you've never chosen this yet. You haven't chosen that how I feel matters to you. You can't feel good without me feeling good. Make sense? Do you guys get this one? If I can't feel good unless you feel good, it's not going to feel like self-sacrifice. You see? Because if you feel good, I'm going to feel good. It doesn't feel like self-sacrifice. Do you get that? Like, okay, so, so let's go back to the, the scenario we're playing with. If, um, if you don't do the dishes, given the process we just took, I'm not going to feel like I'm self-sacrificing in that. Because I now understand why you don't want to and can't. So 
So here's your third option. Third option is either you put your energy in whatever direction you want to and pay for somebody to do the dishes for you because what my need is for you to just take responsibility for it, however that looks to you. I just need to know it's going to be done. And like, if you promise me it's going to be done, you got to do it. It's not like, I promise you, psych, I didn't do it today. That's a hell no for me. Do you get why? Said it last bit again. <laughs> okay. You, if you're going to take responsibility, so through this whole process, if we were in a relationship, you just learned that what the most important thing for me is, is for you to take the responsibility for the dishes. Mm -hmm. That's our agreement, right? So I can't control when you do it or how you do it. That's up to you. What I really need is to know that you're going to do it. Whether it's taking responsibility to get someone else to do it or doing it yourself on your own time, I need it to get done. I need to consider that off my plate and not mine. Does that make sense? Mm. Is that something you can commit to? Yeah, yeah. Then that's our third option. So by having this conversation now, if I give you crap for it again, it's my problem. Mm. Do you see that? Mm. That's me taking responsibility. I don't get to give you crap for it because we just agreed that it's completely up to you as long as it's up to you. <laughs> but if you don't do it, that's going to be a huge issue. That's actually a breach of trust. Does that sound okay or no? It sounds okay. Okay. There you go, you guys. We just found our third option. But I can guarantee, after working with you, you're not ready for a relationship. It's not even an insult. It's like, it's where you are right now. Like, you need autonomy and lots of it. And to really choose it without really guilting yourself for not being in a relationship. Does that sound doable? I can do that. Okay. Thank you.